About a hundred years ago, on the Wabash River in Indiana, Robert Owens set out to establish a new city. Even before he had established the city, he knew what the name would be, New Harmony. The name was intentional because this was going to be a planned community like no other. There would be happiness, cutting edge technology, prosperity through education. In short, it was going to be utopia. Owens then advertised his dream and invited all people to come and join him and live with him in New Harmony. And people came. And New Harmony did amazing things. They founded the first free public school for both boys and girls. New Harmony opened the first free public library in the United States. One citizen of New Harmony went on to become the first president of Purdue University. Another citizen of New Harmony went on to become a legislature in, legislator in Washington, D.C., who had the idea to establish the Smithsonian Institution. It was an amazing place. And yet, I bet, despite all these remarkable things, you have never heard of New Harmony, have you? Because it lasted for a grand total of two years. What went wrong with New Harmony? People. Grouchy people, opinionated people, manipulative people, arrogant people, narcissistic people, grabby people, greedy people, sinful people. New Harmony failed because of people, not for vision, but because human beings were asked to carry out the vision. And in this, New Harmony was just simply another piece of evidence in the long string of history of what happens to things and institutions run by people. They rarely succeed. They fail every single time because we're flawed. One of the first core truths of more people, more problems comes right out of the story of the flood that's before us today and that we're looking at in our series of Bible stories I should know. At the heart of the story, what drives this whole story is the truth that people are flawed. You remember the backdrop. We've rehearsed it so far this fall at North Hills. God creates humanity. God creates the world. He looks at it all. He creates it good. He looks at it a second time and says, nope, it's not good. It's very good. And then things go sideways and a little bit downhill when evil sneaks into the garden in the form of a snake and Adam and Eve take the tempter's bait and the world is stained with sin. They lie and they hide from God. And then last week we saw that Adam and Eve's older son, Cain, actually kills his younger brother, Abel. Then human beings start a pattern of harming and hurting each other. Some don't kill just their brothers, but also their sisters. They start war and fights. They start fighting over land. They fight over gold. They fight over boundaries. They fight over water rights. They fight over oil. They fight over diamonds. They invent weapons to kill one another more efficiently. Some even overtake cockpits and fly commercial airplanes full of innocent civilians into buildings full of innocent civilians. As one preacher put it, when Adam and Eve's son Cain killed his brother Abel, the first murder but not the last, humankind went on breaking what God had made until by the sixth chapter of Genesis, God runs out of pity. I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, God said. People, together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Probably the most sobering sentence in all of the Bible. What a fast narrative to go from God saw that everything was good to 
I'm sorry I made it. God looks down and he sees the problem is people. The imagination of human hearts is evil continuously, except one. There now in the story is one human being who pleased God, and his name was Noah. And God comes to Noah and says, Noah, here's the plan. We're going to blot out humans because they corrupted everything and they corrupt. We're going to have a clean start, except this time I'm going to start over with a really, really good family, and that's you and your family. So Noah, here's what you're going to do. I need you to go build the world's biggest boat. Start by amassing a stash of cypress. From stern to bow, make her 450 feet long. Inside, there's to be three levels, and then divvy up those levels into different compartments because not only you and your family are going to ride the world's biggest boat, but you're also going to have passengers join you. So I want you to find a pair of every animal, except if they're good for sacrifices. Then you're going to bring in seven pairs of them because you're going to need a stash for sacrifices. And now we get to the part of the story that every single Sunday school teacher loves to teach. The boat is built, the door is flopped over, and here comes the pairs. Llamas, rabbits, cheetahs, panda bears, koalas, chinchillas, dachshunds, inchworms. They all come marching two by two into a handmade mega boat made by a man who, withstanding the mockery of his entire community, trusted God. And I wonder if by now Noah isn't thinking, God, you may have the wrong guy. When all are on board, God himself shuts the door. And here we see already, even though judgment is carried out, don't you love it that God's heart and mind is starting to change? Because the text now says, the Lord shut them in. I see that like the text is saying, the Lord tucked Noah and his family and all the animals safely inside, saying, you're going to be okay. Not so much now looking like a scowling judge, but now looking all the world like a compassionate parent. And with the door shut up, sure enough, here comes the rain. The heavens open up. The ice sheets of Greenland melt away. The snow and ice of Siberia melt. The rivers flood. The dams break. Tsunamis sweep over the lands. Hurricanes ravage the coast. And everything is swept away. God cleanses it all. A relentless storm that will last 40 days and 40 nights. And even after the rain, the surge lasts another 150 days. Nothing but nothing is left. Just one boat bobbing on the waves. Notice there were no instructions for a rudder or a sail. It's just bobbing like a cork, helpless but for the grace of God. And God remembers Noah just as he promised. The waters recede, the ark wrecks on the top of a mountain. Noah opens up a window, he first let out a raven. The raven just circles and comes back, it had nowhere to land. He waits a week. He sends out a dove, it too comes back. He has to wait another week. He sends out a dove again, this time it comes back with a little olive leaf in its beak. Noah waits another seven days. Sends the bird out the third time. This time it doesn't come back. And so Noah opens the door of the ark and looks out at a new world and all those animals bound out of the ark. And Noah builds an altar to give thanks. And God sees Noah's gratitude, but would you believe it? God sees something else then too. Now he sees that Noah, too, is not perfect. Noah gets drunk and naked. It's shameful. He's shameful. And his family is just as shameful. 
And God looks closely again and sees that Noah, too, had all the same old flaws of all the humans before him. The evil imagination of the heart continues on. But this time, God makes a decision. Am I going to destroy the earth again? No, this is the crux of the passage. God says to Noah, nope, this time I will not destroy the earth again. Instead, I'm going to make a covenant with you, an agreement. No strings attached, unconditional. Never, ever again am I going to blot out humanity or animals. Never will I do it again because now this time I'm going to covenant with you and all your descendants and all the creatures of the earth. I am on your side. This will never happen again. Even though you are flawed, even though you live with all inclination toward evil, I declare I am for you, never against you. And God says to prove it as an eternal sign, look, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. Think of that. A rainbow, as the name suggests, is a bow, as in a bow and arrow, a weapon. But this is an unstrung bow, a disarmed weapon in the sky, a huge symbol of peace. And God says, whenever you see that bow, disarmed weapon in the sky, remember my covenant. I'm always on your side. And with that, the flood story becomes one of the first stories of how God will rescue us from us. What this story is telling us is that if we're going to try to fix humanity by picking ourselves up and polishing ourselves off and throwing some more money at it and starting over and picking out the best of it, it will not work because human-made utopias never work because more people, more problems. So is there hope? Of course. And the first hope that we see here in our text screams at us from the text. It shouts that the hope is that God now is always on our side. You remember that every time you see a rainbow. But God gave us even more clearer signs than the rainbow of Genesis to signal his commitment to be for us and never against us. For not in a boat made of wood, but in a manger made of wood, and then on a cross made of wood, God gives Jesus the ultimate sign, person, who confirms God's undying commitment to us never to destroy us, but to renew. And when Jesus walked out of that tomb on Easter morning, it was the clearest sign that God was for us, that God had tucked this world and our lives into the safety of his eternal embrace. There could be no more comforting words for us today. And it was all rehearsed here in Rebecca's baptism, wasn't it? There was water, there was God's promise, the God confirmation given to Rebecca that God will remember her forever and will not treat her as her sins deserve. She will be remembered and held and loved for an eternity. For God says in baptism, I am your God. You are my child. And we see that the waters of chaos have become the waters of promise and new birth. You have been washed, you have been made clean, and you have been securely tucked in with the saving, internal embrace of God. There's no better word. It's also interesting that through history, the ark floating on water in the midst of a storm has always doubled as a metaphor for the church. It's no coincidence in Christian architecture that this part of the church where the gospel is read and preached, the good news, we call this the nave, which is the Latin word for boat. Because good news always comes from a boat and that's why if you look at the architecture of nearly every Christian church, if you look up from the ceiling, 
you will most likely see something that looks like an inverted boat. Exposed beams and shiplap. Because you see, we are here in a sense in Noah's Ark, in the midst of a storm. Life on this ark is not perfect because the sailors on the ark aren't perfect. That's because the church too is made up of grouchy people, opinionated people, manipulated people, arrogant people, needy people, narcissistic people, greedy people, sinful people. But if we embrace together the grace of God and share that grace with each other, then I'm telling you, life inside the ark is still a lot better than the storm outside. And my challenge to all of us this week is when we leave this ark on dry ground, is to go out from this ark, find a way to give a sacrifice of praise to God, and to tell and demonstrate to the world the deep, deep love of God. I want you to pay attention this week to who God sends into your camp because I'm telling you, they will come to you, maybe not with these words, but what they're trying to tell you is, I am so tired of the storm. And that will give you an opportunity to tell them about the tucked in embrace of God who is for them and for us and always for the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.